Guys, we're moving forward with the tier list theme. I've got a couple of these before I burn out. I got two or three left to do and then I'll, I'll let it cool off. Seven tops. No more than 10, no more than 10 tier lists and then we're moving on. Now we are doing specialty bars. I have gone on rants about specialty bars in the past. Some of them I find very helpful. Other times they're just stupid, gimmicky, waste of time. People spend five, $800 on these bars to have them in their home gym. The way that I'm going to rank this, we're going S tier to D tier. S is going to be something that solves a ton of problems. It's versatile, uh, it's easy to use, it's more appropriate for more people. That's gonna be more of a must have specialty bar as opposed to things at the bottom, which are going to be gimmicky. They don't really solve a lot of problems. Um, they have very, very limited use cases. So there's things you can only do for like one thing. And if there's other ways to do it without getting that one bar, it gets ranked down more than that. So that's the scale we're working off of. Now there will be affiliate links in the description for anybody who's looking to stock up their home gym and is looking for more information about these products. It's an easy way to support this channel if you're considering buying already. And of course that support is greatly appreciated. We're gonna start off with the Sporting Goods Store $50 Chrome Bar. You can get these on Amazon. You can get these at like Big Five or Dick's. This is where you walk in that day. You see the shiny bar next to the like Marcy home gym setup. 50 bucks, you pick it up, you're good to go. Now, these might as well be made of tin foil. I used to have one of these and it was perfectly fine until I think I tried squatting over 315 on it and then it bent permanently. I believe that's what Joe Sullivan was using when the bar folded around him like a, like a taco. It's not made for weight, it's not made for durability. Usually the knurling is really slick and it's hard to even get a good grip on it. It's only benefit, it's, it's that it's cheap and you can go get it right now. So if you're just starting out, if you are like complete noob status, you're bottom of the barrel, just getting your foot in the water and you wanna start today, by all means go get one. It's gonna be a while before you reach the limit, but these bars are meant to be outgrown. These are, I'm gonna call these C tier. The only reason this bar is not D tier because there is potentially a case to be made for somebody who just wants a cheap starter set when you're benching 75 pounds, it doesn't matter. When you're squatting 135 pounds, it doesn't matter. So it might give some mileage for a couple of years until it gets outgrown. Just be aware, it is meant to be outgrown. We're gonna put this guy firmly in C tier. So keep that in mind when I put a bar into D tier, like these bars are so bad, they rank below the shitty Chrome bars you get at your neighborhood sporting goods store. Just a little point of reference for you guys. Up next is the rusted power bar from your high school. This is the bar that I am very partial towards. When I started training at Strength Built New Braunfels, which has every bar, every toy you can imagine, and it's empty. I love that gym. It's a beautiful place to train. I got shit because of all the bars. When I went into squat, I grabbed the rusted one that looked like the bar that they kept under the bleachers. We had an outside weight room that was under the bleachers behind chain link fencing. So everything was rusted to shit and I loved it. The smell, the texture, I mean, so much like just brought me back to that point where I was very excited to lift early on when I didn't care what it looked like or, or how I did it, just that it worked. So these bars are gonna be a little more heavy duty. These are rated for some weight typically, um, not much flex. Knurling's typically worn, but the rust gives it a little bit of uh, a grit to it. Uh, a little bit of a chance of tetanus, but you know, if you have your shots, you're fine. Uh, this bar, I'm gonna say this bar is goaded. This is like one of my favorite bars, mainly for nostalgia, but because it's usually just a good multi-purpose bar that you can do anything on, fundamentally, it's as good as any other bar you're gonna find. Strength snobs are gonna turn their nose up at it in favor for the super expensive specialty power bar with the standardized Alico plates. It's fundamentally as good as any other bar. Strength snobs are gonna turn their nose up at it in favor of the hot pink fucking astronaut bar with the Alico standardized plates that they have no business using. But this bar develops you just as well while also conditioning you not to be a picky fucking lifter, which is the worst kind of lifter. You don't wanna set yourself up for failure if you ever do compete by teaching yourself that you should only be lifting on the most perfect of equipment. And I'm gonna add a thousand growth points to this thing if it's a little bit bent, like just a little bit to where it wants to roll out of your hands when you deadlift. I do have a fondness for junkyard type stuff. I spent a lot of time doing strongman work in my mom's backyard with makeshift equipment. So if you're motivated to grow, worry less about the equipment. In fact, 
there should be a couple of points of inconsistency, of, of chaotic variability, just to temper you to be able to adapt. So you have the most basic amount of resilience if circumstances aren't completely fucking perfect. I'm gonna call the rusted power bar S tier. This is, this is the granddaddy piece of equipment. This is what everybody should be obligated to start with. You have to earn your way to those $1,000 weightlifting bars. Quick shout out to today's sponsor and friend of the channel, Boost Camp. Boost Camp is where you can find my programs along with many others absolutely free in digital form. You can download the app for free on your phone's app store. Keep track of your workouts, punch in your numbers, update your progress, super easy to use. Check it out, you have no reason not to. Big thank you to Boost Camp for sponsoring today's video. Okay, now we're gonna go into a standard power bar. So a, a power bar is specialty in that it's made specifically for powerlifting. It's very plain, but it's versatile, and they're usually rated for more weight than the normal bars, certainly than the, the chrome shitty bars we talked about earlier. It's usually rated for 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Should have some good sharp knurling on it, and it should be a little bit stiffer. And you can generally do just about anything. The Ohio bar that Rogue sells is a really good bar. That's a good example of this. You can actually use it for Oli stuff. If it has a center knurling, it might fuck up your collarbone a little bit, but I certainly have done cleans and snatches uh, and lots of push presses on my Ohio power bar. Olympic lifting stomps might be inclined to turn their nose up at it, insisting that their wrists will break if like the diameter's off a little bit or if the collars don't spin just right. They might be justified. Olympic lifting is a highly technical, uh, highly a fixed sport. Everything's the same. You can bank on the equipment being similar and it's a very precise sport. So I can't knock them too much, but for you general strength aficionados, uh, it's certainly uh, a bit different than powerlifting and especially strongman where that variability actually improves your training. Uh, I'm going to call the standard power bar S tier because it's just the most durable and the most versatile bar. Like you can do everything, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't have the nostalgia points that the old rusted bar does, but it's just as good and it's less likely to give you tetanus, so it all comes out in the wash. Next up, we're onto a deadlift bar. These noodle bars are specifically made. It's like technology evolves, not to make us better lifters, but just to make us look like better lifters. The bar is longer, it's thinner, it has razor sharp knurling on it. The idea is that it should help really heavy weights stick in your hand. So if you have a shitty grip, you're relying on the knurling, but also if you have a shitty grip and you rely on the knurling, you're gonna lose all your calluses. So this is what takes everybody's skin off. If there's a little bit of humidity in the air and you have a shitty grip and you're about to pull a max effort attempt on a deadlift bar, just have the peroxide on deck and some bandages because you're gonna lose your calluses. This is made to flex as much as possible. That's the point of a deadlift bar. Again, thinner and longer, you get more flex. It takes longer for the weight to break off the ground. So not only are you at a mechanical advantage before you take the whole weight, but you get this runway to really yank into the bar. So more explosive reactive pullers are gonna benefit a lot more. And sumo lifters can exploit the fuck out of it because those couple inches of flex can be the difference between them being in their strongest possible position and just getting absolutely stapled. So a lot of people have said the, the problem of sumo lifters uh, can be solved just by having a standardized stiffer bar and guys aren't gonna be tugging 1,100 pounds on this bar because they're just not that strong in that really spread out position. I'm inclined to think there's some truth to that. It is a fun bar to lift on and you can justify lifting on it because it pops up in contests, in powerlifting contests and in strongman contests. And it's just different enough where you might benefit from giving a, a tug or two to kind of figure out how to time your pull. So a little bit of specificity involved. Uh, I would still say stiffer bars are overall better as developers and at better for testing strength. Uh, and if you rely on this, it's just like a bounce deadlift. If you rely on the whippy bar, it's gonna turn into a crutch where the second you move away from a whippy bar, you're gonna get absolutely stapled. I'm gonna call this B tier. You wanna use this if you have a contest coming up, you know, get a little familiar with it, but it certainly is not necessary. The best guys on a stiff bar, likely gonna be the best guys on a whippy bar. I would not worry at all about making sure that you include it in. If you have access to it, that's fine. Just don't let don't let it dominate your training because it will become a crutch. Next up is the Olympic bar. This is going to appeal specifically to CrossFitters and anybody who does Olympic lifting in kind of a serious fashion. It's a thinner bar, so it's easier to grip. It's easier to hook grip. The collars spin like butter. 
you're only going to notice this if you're cleaning and snatching with like substantial weights. Uh, not nearly as whippy, but it definitely does oscillate, especially as the bumpers get further out. You get a few hundred pounds on the bar. It, when you're in the, the jerk position, they actually have rules against, against getting the, the plates moving because you can game the whip on the way up. Uh, I had a real fun experience at a corporate gym where they added a bunch of these to try to appeal to the functional fitness crowd. And this was the only one they had available to squat with. And I hit a 600 pound triple uh, and almost got fucking stapled at the bottom because I was used to squatting on a regular power bar. And as I came down the hit, the weights flex down and you think you're ready to come up with the weight and it hits you at the bottom. I felt that in my upper back. I still made it through because, you know, come on. But it definitely was a surprise and it, it is a different trick. Really high bar Olympic lifters, like I said, they'll learn to game it. They'll stay super upright and they'll take that whip and bounce right out. You can see Pat Mendez doing that when he hit that, that ridiculous 800 pound beltless ass to grass squat where he just bounced the shit out of it. Um, in his situation, I'm inclined to think if it was a stiffer bar, that might not have went up. So it's funny how these bars will like exploit individual weaknesses and the way it might staple one person might be the thing that allows another person to, to get through that stick point. It's very individual. I'm going to call an Olympic lifting bar an A tier bar because it's, I mean, it's solid. You can do just about anything on it. It's gonna be about just as useful to you as a, uh, as a, a power lifter or as a general strength athlete. You might not like the whippiness when you squat, but developmentally for 99% of you, I don't think it's gonna matter. This is a problem with it. Non-Olympic lifters don't respect the specialized nature of these bars, so they repurpose it for stupid shit. So if you're slamming it into the racks when you bench, or if you're doing a bunch of violent rack pulls, you'll fuck them up beyond repair. And then the actual Olympic lifters who need a straight bar to lift on are gonna be shit out of luck. Um, but if you have access to an Olympic bar, absolutely no reason you can't do your regular training on it. Uh, I just wouldn't go out of your way to get your hands on one unless you're actually an Olympic lifter. And then it's pretty important. Next up is a squat bar. Longer, thicker bar, no whip whatsoever. These are actually heavier, typically heavier. So 45, I think they're generally 55 pounds and you can feel it. The diameter's thicker, it feels stiffer on your back. Um, much better for heavy squats than a, than a whippy bar. Like I said, I had that problem, almost getting stapled from the oscillation of the weight on my back. Complete opposite. I come down, I like the control, and when I hit hard, when I go up, I want the weight to go up. And that's exactly what happens. So it generally feels a bit more secure. Now, unless you've been squatting on shitty dollar store bars, you're likely not gonna notice the difference uh, between this and a regular power bar, at least until you get over four or five bills. I still develop my squat, hit my biggest numbers on a regular power bar, and I don't know that it's worth like fighting over this one to get your hands on it. I'll say I noticed a, a minor difference in feel. I don't feel like that difference would have led to actual performance. I certainly don't feel like I would have had to have squatted on that bar to prepare for a powerlifting meet. I don't think it's necessary. Again, this is another thing for finicky lifters to quibble over whether or not the gym has the right bar. Um, it feels nice, but it doesn't add anything to the training effect and it's not necessary. So I'm going to give the squat bar C tier listing. It's not completely useless. It, it does something, but you're gonna see it in meets. Just count it as a, as like a vacation. You know, it feels nice. Things are a little easier because you've been training the hard way, but you're not better off for having every goddamn squat session you do on a squat bar. Going into the mammoth bar, some strongman controversy here. The elephant bar used at the Arnold. Thor was chasing the record and, uh, you know, they were saying is his deadlift going to count the same as Eddie Hall's deadlift because it's on a different implement. It's a longer bar, again, designed to whip more. I swear, and it's a thing. I mean, as strongman tries to overload, do what it does, handle the heaviest weights, it's bonus points. If they can make it look like a more legitimate lift to kind of blur the lines, it's in everybody's best interest to have like, no, 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 don't look at the flex. Don't look at the fact that it's a different lift. Um, it's a deadlift off the ground. So just don't, you know, you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to think about it, dude. And that's kind of dumb. Uh, so a mammoth bar, it's a deadlift bar squared. Extra long, long whip, so same thing. You're mechanically in a very advantaged position. It's almost your kneecaps before the weight breaks off the ground. The Hummer tire deadlift was a, was a much worse example of that. So you can yank into it harder, you get time to ramp up, and by the time you get to that stronger position, you have more momentum. So you should be able to actually lift more than you would theoretically on a, from a, a rack pull on a dead stop. 
Also, the oscillation can be gamed. A lot of people talk about how it's harder because of the oscillation. That comes down to you and how you train, and people can absolutely exploit that. There's some people, like Zadrunas was ridiculously strong. He pulled 200 pounds more on, uh, on the Hummer Tire deadlift, where a lot of guys wouldn't even match their best deadlift from the floor. So it absolutely can be gamed. The benefits of training with it, ego stroking. That's about it. If you have one in a contest, because they're starting to pop up a little more in amateur contests, I've actually been on one a couple of times where a couple of years ago, you couldn't find them anywhere. Uh, if you have one, give it a tug or two, but it's not necessary. The, the 12 weeks you spend deadlifting on just that is not going to give you an edge. It's usually the best deadlifter wins, usually. So just make sure that there isn't anything obvious that's gonna screw you up but you don't need to train on it in order to win a mammoth bar deadlift. You still have to make sure that your hips and back are stronger and that you're a proficient puller. And there's a whole bunch of other ways you can do that. I'm gonna call this C tier. A lot of fun, but it's an easy distraction and it's not necessary for prep, so skip it. Now we're going into the axle bars. One of my favorite bars to train on. I love axle bars. Uh, it's two inches thick the whole way through. Most think that it's just for testing your grip and newbie strongman competitors will get confused when they allow straps, which is weird because there hasn't been a strapless axle deadlift at a major strongman contest in like 10 years. They used to have it all the time, but in a sufficiently big enough contest, you're guaranteed one or two bicep pops from a mixed grip uh, max axle deadlift. So people will ask, doesn't it defeat the purpose wearing straps? Absolutely not. The thickness, and again, when you're newer, you're not gonna notice these differences. A stiff bar between a whippy bar, you're not gonna be able to exploit the benefits of one. It's gonna feel all heavy, it's gonna feel all awful. So once you get stronger, you will feel how stiffer bars stick to the ground. From that first millimeter you break, the whole thing has to move versus a couple of inches before you take the whole weight. It's a massive difference. It's also thicker, so it's a little bit in front of you, which actually makes a little bit of a difference, makes it a bit more cumbersome. Most of you can reinforce your pull off the floor by doing like a slight deficit or just pulling on a regular power bar as opposed to a deadlift bar. This does kick it up a notch. Uh, it's not necessary, but if you have access to one, it is, uh, I think, a very useful way of reinforcing your deadlift ability and being a more well-rounded deadlifter, it will certainly improve your leg drive off the bottom. I'm gonna call this A tier. It's super versatile. They aren't expensive to get. I mean, I use a, a piece of galvanized pipe from Home Depot I got for like 15 bucks and it worked up to a point. If you're gonna do really heavy pulls from the ground or if you're gonna drop your presses from overhead, invest in one that's, that's a little sturdier, but they're still not that much and they're versatile. You can press, you can deadlift, you can squat and get the same benefit of a, of a squat bar. I don't think it's uncomfortable to squat with, but as a deadlift accessory tool, I think it's just too easy to implement. I think it does a lot of things really well. So I'm a big fan of these. They're, they're real easy to get a hold of. Next up, we're going into the cambered bar. Uh, now we're getting into the weird ones. These are the ones that don't look like bars. They got weird bends and folds and different features on it. The camber has the bar hang lower. So the weights hang lower, puts the center of mass closer to your hips. So that means the center of mass is lower, which is good, but you can also pull the weight back. So it's almost like the way a trap bar, the weights in line with your hips, makes you much stronger, puts much more of the work in your hips. Now for squatting, I think it's good for developing hip power, good for recovery. You're going to experience less total stress on, on your back, your upper and mid back. Um, for good mornings, it's great for hip power because a safety bar pushes the weight in front, so your upper back has to work harder. Camber bar pulls the weight back, so it's more in your glutes and hamstrings. This is my preferred method of doing good mornings. So for squatting, I think it has the biggest use case in programs that require a lot of variation. So that's usually high frequency with a lot of effort. Or if you're doing like a conjugate type thing where you're going as heavy as you can, you need rotations. So this will help with recovery but as a specific developmental tool for fixing a weakness or attacking some, some specific part of your lift, I don't know that there's that much of a use case for squatting. For good mornings, I think it's fantastic. I'm gonna call this C tier. As much as I like this bar for good mornings, it is my preferred method, uh, but I wouldn't break the bank to get access to one of these. There's really limited uses for it. You can't apply it to a lot of different things. Um, people might argue that like the stability is a, is a selling point of it, which I strongly disagree. Um, it doesn't even swing that much. Usually the guys fit, you know, grab it in the front and hold it, fix it in place. Um, if you have access to one and you prefer lifting on it, that's great. Uh, if you need a rotation of movements, again, if you have access to one, that's great. But there's so many other things you can do 
that uh, this is really heavy. It takes up a lot of space and you can only do like one or two things with it. So it ranks a little bit lower to me. But again, if you have access to one, I think it is a good bar specifically for those purposes that I mentioned. Going into a safety squat bar. We're at the point where just about every gym has a safety bar. The pad and handles are super comfy for us fat lifters who can't get their arms back. We get like elbow and shoulder pain from uh, holding a regular squat bar. So people default to it for that. The weight swings forward. So it's like a hybrid between a back squat and a front squat. And that stresses the upper and mid back quite a bit. So it, it'll get prescribed for things like fixing a, a forward lean by the idea that you make the back stronger because you have to push back into the weight more. And then by the time you go back to a straight bar, it's not an issue. Uh, the lifter will get around this. The lifter will deal with this difference by either staying completely upright. You'll find that if you treat it like a front squat, it goes off way easier because it's very analogous to that movement. Or they just get stronger and stronger by pushing back into it and it carries over that way. I'm gonna call safety bar a, a B tier exercise. I do like safety bars. Um, it's a good break from squatting if you do have those shoulder or elbow issues. Good developmental accessory for squats and good mornings. Um, not mandatory. Again, I developed myself for years. I developed my lifters for years without access to a safety bar. A lot of people won't have these in their garage gyms. You're not going to miss anything by not having this. So again, if you have access to it and you need a rotation of movements, if you're having specific issues, it's great. Just a little less of a universal use case. A lot of people will put these in by default as like their primary accessory. If you're gonna have just a broad blanket accessory, I would get good at front squats. I, I think that's going to set you up better. And you'll probably notice that you're a lot stronger if you do go back to a safety bar squat from that. That's, that's my two cents, that's my bias. Not a useless bar by any stretch but don't blow your wad trying to get one. It's not going to just completely overhaul your squat game. All right, notice this D list, this D tier right here. It's pretty empty. It's kind of rare for me. Usually I'm a lot more critical, have a lot more negative things to say. Usually I populate that field pretty quick, but hold tight, we're getting to it. So right now we have the Mars bar. The Mars bar is a solution in search of a problem. This is what happens when you have a market that rewards variety and variation. And as long as you have something different or unique, you can sell it to people, even if you don't really have a case for it. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a use case for this. Like, do the conjugate wizards have some special application? Maybe. But 99% of the time, this is getting used because, hey, look, a new toy. Or it's getting used so you can post a video of you squatting with more weight than you can physically squat. So this is like a super low bar back squat. It places the bar, it goes all the way over your back with these giant pads, and the bar is fixed like right across your mid back. So that's where the weight loads. So the way you move the weight, you're pushing into this bar, which is on your mid back. It's almost like a, a machine back extension. It's how I think of it. But the fact is the weight's closer to your hips, which makes it much, much stronger. I mean, this is why you have that Russian guy that's trying to do the low bar, where the bar's almost sliding out. Somehow he's getting white lights with the bar almost sliding off his back. The closer you get the bar to your hips, the more weight you're gonna be able to move for the same effort. It's just the way it is. And if you're one of these asshats that uses these to do hat field squats, you're fucking fired. Revisit why you actually lift in the first place. So I'm gonna say D tier. Like I said, it's a solution in search of a problem. This is just a massive distraction for most people that use it. This is not going to be the thing that fixes your squat. Whatever use case it might have gets negated by the fact that it's just inappropriate for most of the people that are gonna be spending their money on it and that's where I rank things the harshest. Going into the Swiss bars, now we got some upper body stuff. A Little too much love given to the squat and deadlift. So it's a neutral grip bar. I never got to the bottom of the title Swiss bar. I always assumed it was because Switzerland is neutral. It's a neutral grip bar. I don't know if weightlifters are that clever. Uh, it's versatile for the upper body. I really like it for neutral grip curls, tricep extensions, rows, pull-ups, and of course, all kinds of benching variations. It can be a great workaround when a straight bar kills your elbows, which if you live and die around a straight bar like I have for years, that's a thing. There's a point where regular skull crushers kill me, but neutral grip is fine. Similarly for things like curls, it can target specific muscles. For instance, neutral grip will really hit the long head of your tricep. Uh, so it's good for tricep accessory work with your presses. Um, if you're doing floor presses, rack lockouts, stuff like that. So it has a bunch of uses. So I'm gonna call the Swiss bar A tier really just for its versatility. There's so many cool things you can do with it. It solves multiple problems. Now, don't get it mistaken. Your gains don't hinge on getting a Swiss bar. 
it's just a tool that is usually pretty cost effective, doesn't take up a lot of space, and it can be used for a wide variety of things. So for that reason, it ranks high. Now we're going into the Arch Nemesis bar, which is like a modified Swiss bar. Now I just got one of these a couple weeks ago. Bells of Steel was kind enough to send one over and I plan on doing some movement demos. There's some cool bench pressing stuff you can do with it. Uh, it's, it's like uh, the Cadillac bar that Duffin puts out. This one's kind of cool because it has an attachment where you can uh, use it for lat pull downs. So that's kind of cool. You get more use out of it. And actually because it's rackable, I realized I could suspend it in my rack and do pull-ups and I prefer doing close grip pull-ups. So the bow on the bar allows for a deficit press. So the wider you go, now you have this, this range. You can get a couple inches of extra motion. And actually one of the videos I'm working on is about range in bench pressing and how it's tied to bench pressing's role as a developmental exercise. We live in an era where everybody's telling you to tuck your uh, elbows and pinch your shoulder blades and arch and do a really stable powerlifting style bench. And they're also saying that bench sucks as a developmental movement for your chest. So I'm, I'm gonna get to the bottom of that right there. But one of the big things we find is that the more stretch you get, it tends to be better for hypertrophy. In fact, working at the stretch seems to be about as, if not more important for hypertrophy than just going through the full range of motion. So that's something not a lot of us do. Most of us don't have access to a bar that allows us to, to do that deficit. So the fact that that feature is paired with all the other things you can do with a multi-crib bar, I'm gonna call this bar uh, an A tier. All the functionality of a Swiss bar uh, with a bit of extra utility. I, I really like this Nemesis bar. I think it's, uh, it's a solid piece of equipment. I think I'm gonna get a lot of use out of this, especially I've had shoulder issues over the years and elbow issues. This is probably going to take up most of my bench pressing work for the near future. So I'm looking forward to put this one to the test and, uh, and get a good review on it. Going into the cambered bench bar. So it's the same principle as a cambered squat bar, but the bow, the, the camber is in the middle of the bar so that you can get that same effect, so that you can get that deficit bench press. Your hands can go below the plane of your chest. Now these are ones you don't see quite as often. And the reason is because it is only really useful for that one application. Also, I'm kind of torn here because deficit benching is great. I think it is a great accessory movement, but most of the people who use this type of bar are usually doing it with their arch tuck, like squished bench press setup where they're trying to reduce their range. So you'll see like an equip lifter doing their deficit benching, but it's in their powerlifting setup. You get the exact same effect by just relaxing your shoulders or putting your feet up uh, or just extending the paws at the bottom. So I, I just think that's kind of funny. I mean, maybe you can rationalize that having a deficit in your powerlifting setup is beneficial. But again, for most people using this, uh, that's, that's a little bit excessive. Um, it just, it doesn't have very many use cases. It's the one thing. And most of you, I think, can substitute that with other things instead of getting a bar that only does that one thing. If it seems like I'm ranking this different than the Arch Nemesis bar, it's because that's a secondary feature along with all the other things you can use a multi-crib bar for, so it just adds to it. This is a bar that takes up space for that one thing, and it's probably not gonna be very cheap. So I'm gonna call the Deficit Bench Press Bar C tier. It does have a use case, it's certainly not useless. It's good for what it's made for, but there's other ways to mimic it that don't require blowing the money or taking up space. So we're down to the wire here, the trap bar, the controversial trap bar. The trap bar is cool because the weight is in line with your center of mass, and there isn't a physical obstruction by the barbell being in front of your shins. That's why we're so much stronger when a bar gets above our, our knee is because it's now not in the way. Our hips can now come straight through where if you've ever noticed, if you've ever missed a deadlift mid shin, you know your inclination is to roll your hips through and lean back, but your shins are physically stopping that from happening. So trap bar gets around that. So it does change the dynamics of the lift. You can use it a few different ways. You can use your regular deadlift setup and use it to condition a stronger start. It's very good for leg drive. For strongman, I like it because you can roll your hips in. If you're using it to practice for like a car deadlift, that's how you do it. It's not a deadlift. You think of it like a front squat. You roll your hips in, you get upright, and then you just pop them through and you stand up. So it doesn't feel like a deadlift at all. And that has application to other strongman movements, to loading and log cleans and, and everything that requires that hip forward action. And that carries over immensely to deadlifts. So I really like trap bar for that. Uh, it's also great for, um, for protocols that need to be less systemically taxing because you are a little more upright, it is more hips. You can, you can think of it similarly to the way you think of uh, sumo as being developmentally different, less 
torque on the lower back than a conventional deadlift. So there's a recovery element, but this carries over to the conventional deadlift much better. So I do like that fact. If you need a rotation of exercises, if you're deadlifting with high frequency, or you need to take some time off, trap bar is a good option. So I really like trap bar deadlifts. They do a lot if they're used intelligently. I would just warn, resist the urge to overload on the high handles, unless you're a strongman competitor. Uh, you deadlift guys are not gonna get quite as much out of it. You wanna use the low handles. If it feels like shit, good. Do it till it doesn't feel like shit because that should still be an advantage position even though it feels like you're bending over way low. Everybody wants to load up, you know, one, 200 pounds more and try to just yank away at the high handles. You get a lot less carryover like that. I'm going to put the trap bar deadlift at B tier. Um, I really like these. Strong men need to train it. It does a lot of things for other people just go low handle. I'm putting it B tier because I consider it a luxury item. It does have a use case, but again, expensive, takes up a lot of space, not mandatory for your gains. But if you have access to one, there are quite a few things you can do with it. I am a fan of a trap bar. I generally uh, like it as a training tool. So now we're going into the transformer bar. Chris Duffin's brand, he over-engineered the shit out of this bar so you could change it to mimic all kinds of specialty bars. Now, I'm not saying this bar is not a cool fucking concept because it is, but it reminds me of that psychology study where they realized that the more choices people had, generally the more miserable they were. Like if you have a magazine stand with two options for each niche, people can make their selection pretty quick and they'll be pretty happy with it. The opportunity cost is that you only gave up one magazine. But if you're like Barnes and Noble and you have like 14,000 magazines there, you end up spending nine hours evaluating which one you're gonna get until you realize you didn't pick your kid up from school, you grab the first one and you're miserable because you're thinking about all the other options that you didn't have the opportunity to get. Long story short, more options are not better. Uh, it's versatility in combining so many features into one bar should make this an S tier bar. Like it just should. It sounds like more bang for your buck. But in practice, I think it's too much. I think people get it for that feature that they don't actually need. If a gym has this, it has the safety bar. It has the cambered bar. And you're going to be more likely to use those because it's less of a fucking hassle to set up. And besides those settings, I don't know anybody making sick gains off like the goblet squat setting. I think this is a really cool fucking concept. But I think you're going to expect to get more out of this than it will actually give you. I think this is something that people spend money on because it looks cool only to find that they don't use it as much as they thought they would. Um, if, if you have access to one at a gym, that's great. Try it out and see how you like it. Uh, but for you guys working out of your home gym, unless you just absolutely love variations and you wanna do every one of them without having to stock multiple bars, most of you are gonna be better off with just a couple staple bars. Going into the Buffalo bar. Now, I'm not aware of a use case for this beyond it feeling more comfortable to the shoulders, to us bound and broken lifters. It's certainly a useful feature if it applies to you, but that's really damn specific. I believe the bow can also like moderately increase the amount of weight that you're able to handle, which is probably why Chris Duffin decided to use his duffalo bar for his 1K squat triple. I mean, he did that at, at his own place. It wasn't at a public exhibition and it very much seemed like he was just trying to game it as much as he could to arbitrarily say he squatted a thousand pounds for reps. I'm gonna call this a C tier implement. If you have shoulder issues and you can't squat on a, on a straight bar and you have access to one, that's great. If that scenario doesn't apply to you, there's literally no reason for you to be squatting on one. I don't know what it does beyond that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody's gonna say, hey, I use it to, I don't know, bench with for a deficit or something. Maybe there's other things you can do. But as far as I know, guys just use it because they like the way it feels on their shoulders. Uh, going into the Tsunami bar, I've talked about this before. The fucking floppy bar, man. I'm gonna say it's high on gimmicks and it's low on practicality. Again, I know Nick Camby endorses the shit out of it and he's amazing at what he does. I'm inclined to believe he'd be amazing if he didn't use it. Like he says it helps with speed and punching through because the oscillation, you can game it to get a lot of whip at the bottom like Olympic lifters aren't supposed to do. And that can, I guess, teach you to be faster. So maybe some benefit to that. Um, I've heard others talk about stability overhead, which I think is bullshit. Like the idea of shaky, unstable things being a means of getting stronger has been around for a while and it's never really held up. It seems that the most strength specific thing you can do 
is to get more stable and practice handling more and more and more weight in the most stable position, not the least stable position. So I've tried it. The wobble overhead doesn't feel specific to anything I would do in a contest. Uh, I don't know a lot of people that live and die by it. I know a lot of people that tried it since it became more popular, but I don't know anybody that stakes their gains on the tsunami bar. Uh, if you want to fix your lockout, you know, hold your lockout overhead. You can do rack supports. You can do all kinds of things uh, and not feel like you're going to have a bar whip around and knock your teeth out. Uh, this really is the long way to go around for those benefits. I'm going to call the floppy bar D tier. Like I really, uh, God, I just noticed I swapped these out. I put the uh, floppy bar, I thought that was an axle press. That wasn't. Sorry, we got Mike Burke up here doing the axle deadlift. I'm gonna say the, the floppy bar is D tier. I don't think it has a use case. I think most of you are going to just dick around with it because it looks fun and new and interesting. It's not gonna do a damn thing for your lifts. You're not gonna come out better or more aware from it. Uh, you're gonna try it for five or six weeks at a principle, and then you're gonna scrap it and never look at it again. That's what it's gonna do. So save your money. Now the band bell, similar principle as a tsunami bar, but the band bell, I'm gonna rank a little higher. And if it seems like I'm being a hypocrite, let me explain why. The tsunami bar uh, involves hanging bands from the bar. So it's not that the bar is super whippy, it's that the bands hang weights and it oscillates. So there's like divots in the bar to like support the bands. Now I like this for a couple of reasons. One, you're always going to go a lot lighter on this setup than you would on a regular bar or even a tsunami bar. Uh, you're going to be shaking a lot more. And I think that's an asset because you won't be tempted to load it up and try to make it into a pure power movement. So I actually like this for rehab work. I used to do this hanging bands from a, from a regular straight bar. When my shoulder hurt so much, I couldn't do regular straight bar pressing without a lot of pain. I use this instead and I was able to press without pain. Something about the give. I think some of it was neurological. Some of it was the tissue wasn't getting hit all at once with the straight weight. Whatever it was, it allowed me to get a lot of blood in, get some work in until I felt secure enough to do regular presses again. Um, and honestly, the oscillation, if you're fighting it in something like a bench press and you're not used to it, it'll make you sore as shit. Does that mean it's gonna carry over to a stronger bench press? I don't know. Do with that information what you will. Um, but here's the thing. You don't need a band bell to hang kettlebells from a band. You can do that with any bar you have. And I have for a long time. So that kind of works against it a little bit. I generally like this for, for those specific purposes I outlined, um, but it, it's a better use case than the Tsunami, but just not by much. I'll call it a C tier. So that's it guys. Those are the, the specialty bars. What I think about them, what I think they're good for, how I think they rank, if you should waste your money. It looks like you're not gonna do much better than the old rusted barbell that's been sitting out in the junkyard for a few decades. I mean, that's, that's every, that's character building, it's versatile, it's cheap. That's where you wanna invest your money. If you're a little more picky, go ahead and get a power bar. But beyond that, everything else, a bit frivolous. It's not entirely necessary. You wanna spend your time and money on things that are easy to access, that aren't gonna break your bank, and that have an actual use case for what you are trying to do. That's what you wanna look at. So thanks so much for watching, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. Till next time, this is Bromley, I'll see you.